A rhetorical situation is one that a writer analyzes, looking at it from all possible points of views and considering each element of the situation carefully. So, for example, we talked about a couple of things. I don't know, death penalty, uh, owning pets, whatever it is. You decide how you feel about that thing, but you also have to look at it from other people's points of view, right? So, I'm against the death penalty, right? I don't think the government should kill people who kill people, right? So, but I also need to think about what other people think, right? Uh, just because I think that way doesn't mean that that's how it has to be or that's how the world is, right? So when you think about your rhetorical stance or your rhetorical situation, you also need to see how other people see things. You can't just cut yourself off. I'll fix it in a, in a minute. We all working. Right? So I'm against the death penalty, but I know that there are people that are for the death penalty. Why do I think there are people for the death penalty? I need to understand that. Because there's no way for me to have an argument with somebody if I can't see what the other person thinks. I mean, it's, it's no point, right? I'm not growing. I'm against the death penalty. I don't want to hear nothing about the death penalty. That's kind of dumb, right? And so I have to understand other people's points of views. There are some people who are for the death penalty. There are some people who are for the death penalty under certain circumstances. And for me to truly understand how I, where I stand on an issue, I need to understand where other people stand as well that don't agree with me, right? Um, you know, so you have to get used to that concept of, you know, I'm whatever, pro or against, I don't know, but police brutality. But other people feel differently. Everybody's not gonna feel the same way that I feel. And the only way to really understand is to see that people believe in different ways, right? Think about all the possible points of view. All right, so he said you write to remember, you write to understand, you write to test your thinking. So some of the stuff that we're gonna do is gonna require you to analyze things, use your judgment, this idea of a higher level thinking, right? And that's because I want you to start thinking as a high level thinker, right? In, in today's workforce, you, not, you have to be able to do high level thinking, problem solving, and those sorts of things, being able to argue convincingly, right? Knowing, knowing how to do the research to support a claim, right? When you start going to work, and your boss asks you a question and you have an opinion about it, you need to be able to give your opinion and tell why you think that way. Uh, consider your topic and audience, right? Your logic, your logos, what are you saying and why should they care, right? The reason why you don't, your parents or whoever, grandparents, adults in your life aren't doing the things that you want them to do or allowing you to do the things that you want to do is because you haven't tapped into why they should care, right? My kids got it easy. I'm the easy parent, right? Dad, can, can I use your car and I'm gonna go to a party and you know engage in dangerous behavior? I'll be like, okay, be safe. Don't hurt yourself, don't hurt nobody else, right? But to get their mother to do the same thing, it's gonna require them to actually talk to her, quell her fears. Their mother thinks like any time away from her, they're gonna get hurt, right? Or whatever. She doesn't want me and my daughter are supposed to go to uh, Japan this summer. She don't want us to go because planes crash. Like, also, you could be walking down the street and plane crash on top of you. Like, if if we're talking about things that could happen, right? So you're not gonna let your child go have an experience in somewhere else because it's a dangerous world, right? That's ridiculous. So my daughter, not me, because of course we'll start fighting. My daughter has to get her to care about her having that experience. How does she do that? I don't know. That's her challenge. But that's your challenge too, right? You want the teacher to change her grade? Why should they care? They did English 11. I did English 11 way longer than I want to say right now ago, right? So why should I care what grade you get? I might give myself a job, fail half of y'all, and half of y'all still got to take it again, so they hire me to teach it again, which, which would be horrible for the school, because if I fail half my class, I'm a failure, right? Teachers should be able to teach you anything right? Don't, don't go tell the teacher that's failing half the class that I said that they're a horrible teacher. Though. I don't need no problems. All right? So, 
think about things that compel you or puzzle you that you want to learn more about, right? This is your education. Once you leave here, you know, other than the few teachers that actually care about you, your future and what you're doing, I, I don't know, I have not met all the teachers, but let's just say an average of half, about half your teachers really care, right? So if half your teachers really care, then you are in charge of you learning whatever those things are that they're not teaching you, right? Focus your analysis on the people that you most want to reach and people who are gonna take an interest. And then think about how your words connect with diverse audiences. All of us are different, right? There's no, nobody lives in a vacuum. We could all be from the same culture, but we all have different perspectives. We all have different experiences, different lives. So don't assume that, I don't know, cause I'm African American, I like hip hop. I mean, I do like hip hop, but you know, don't make that assumption. Find out first, right? Think about how to interact with people from diverse groups. Don't just hang with people that look like you, think like you, or, and are just like you. Because then you're not growing. You're staying the same. You need to expand your circle of people um, to include people who are diverse. All right. So, in addition to this, you have three purposes for writing. Anytime you sit down and write, you do it for three. This is our speak. You have three reasons that you do that. You're informing someone, you're persuading them, or you're entertaining them. Think about that. Every time that you sit down to write something to somebody, text message, social media post, write, love letter, essay, you're only doing it for one or three reasons, right? I text you, the party starts at nine. Meet me at my house at 845. Information. Oh man, you're not trying to go to the party. Your parents will let you go to the party. Well, you should just tell them that we're going together and there's gonna be adults there, right? First thing. Man, I can't believe you're gonna miss this party. It's gonna be lit. I'm going to send you this video of me dancing right now, right? So anytime you sit down to write, you do it for one of these three reasons. You should think about that, right? If you're persuading somebody, it takes certain tools to persuade someone to do something. If you're entertaining them, it takes certain tools to get them to feel the way. And entertaining ain't always like laughing, because sometimes stuff is entertaining that you cry about, right? You ever seen any of those movies, you know, love movies? They, be all, they got like the sad parts or parts that makes you anxious. That's all entertaining to some people. I don't know why nobody would go to the movies to cry, but beyond me, but some people are entertained by crying. They love the movie because they sit and cry for an hour, right? So you got to figure out what you want to accomplish. Your rhetorical stance is your attitudes towards your topic and audience. Now, of course, you're in high school, so you hate your topic and you hate your audience, but you have to figure out how to connect to them, right? You don't, you don't care whether, you just want the teacher to give you a grade. You want to be done with it and get, get it over with, right? But you do have to think about that. So consider like the time and length that you have to do your paper, what the directions of the assignment are, how you're going to do it. Uh, your language and speaking clearly and your tone and style. All right, so let's get to this first step in the writing process. We're gonna call it the pre-writing stage. And I'm gonna give you some ideas. So you need to pick one of these. Let me erase this right here. We'll talk about that again. And so we're talking about the pre-writing stage. Before you begin writing, you need to get your thoughts down. Now, of course, you don't have to write it down on paper. I told you I'm old school and conservative, so I like to actually write. You don't have to do that for some of these. Some of you can just type up some stuff and we'll, we'll go over it. So let me give you some examples. So, and I'm going to go through each one. I want you to pick one that you like the best because you're gonna use it for an assignment later. So the first one I'm gonna show you is brainstorming. 
Brainstorming is like creating a grocery list about your topic. What's a topic that we can write a paper? What's a cool topic? What's something we can write a paper on that would be cool? That's appropriate, nothing inappropriate. Anybody? Anybody? I feel like that teacher from Fair Beaver. You don't know about that. What's a topic that we can write about? That you would want to write about in English 11. If I said, oh, we're going to write a paper about what y'all like, what you're into, what you. Anybody? Because you have something else. I can't just look at me because they're. Huh? All right. I'll take it. Food is our topic. So the teacher says, Write an essay about food. Let's say your favorite food. Right? So brainstorming is for those of you that always have to make like a list of things. Like if you got four things to do, you kind of keep a list of it. You keep a track of it on your phone, you know, in your notes, you got like whatever. For me, brainstorming works because I'm the person that if I go to the grocery store, I got to have a list. If I don't have a list, then I'm gonna get all the junk I don't need. Oh, I'm gonna get some Captain Crunch and, right? I'm just gonna grab stuff because it's on sale or because I see it. So anytime I go to the store, I need to have a list. That's why, that's why, that's what brainstorming is like. If you're the kind of person that works off like lists of things. So then if I was writing a paper about my favorite food and I was trying to brainstorm what I was gonna write about, well, you know, I'm a fat dude, so, I like all kind of food, like favorite food. My favorite food is like eating. I don't know what you mean, like favorite food. But if I was gonna write a paper and I know my, my teacher expects me to have an answer for what my favorite food is, I might just start writing a list, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, I really don't know, um, right? And so I'll just keep writing that list. And then when I'm ready to write my paper, I can just look and maybe be like, oh, instead of saying like, pizza is my favorite food because I got these two on here, I can say Italian food is my favorite. Or, I mean, who don't like Mexican food, right? So that way it expands what I can talk about, right? Because like I said, I'm a fat dude, I like to eat. I, favorite food is whatever you put in front of me that tastes good in that day, right? That's my favorite. So this topic may be hard, so I write a list out and try to figure out like, oh, okay, I'm gonna say Mexican food is my favorite. I like tacos, I like ceviche, right? Burritos, chili bebe, right? So then it expands what I can talk about. It doesn't limit me to like, oh, pizza is my favorite food. It gives me a, a bunch of things that I can talk about in my paper to give the sense to my teacher who I am. I like a lot of different stuff, but I'm gonna pick Mexican food because they have all these different types of food I can use, right? So that's brainstorming. That's the, literally going into your brain and trying to figure it out. That's for people who like to make lists. All right, the next one is free writing. It's also called looping or free speaking. Free writing is what you do for the quick write every day, right? You come in, you see what's on the board, it don't take no preparation, you just start writing and email it to me. That's what free writing is, right? You take, you know, however long, five, 10 minutes, and you just write, and you don't stop writing. So once the time are typing, right? From the time you start, you just don't stop. You just keep typing the information until the time is up. Because what that does, that's for people who have a hard time starting papers. If you have a hard time with beginning your papers, then free writing is the one that you wanna do. Right? Because it forces you to start writing. Remember, your brain is thinking about seven to 14 other things that don't have nothing to do with writing. So you're trying to get your brain to start writing. So when you have um, writer's block and you can't think of what to write, free writing is a good strategy to start yourself writing, 
right? Because it don't have to be perfect at the beginning. This is a process, right? If I'm making pancakes, the first pancake is always messed up. I don't know if y'all know how to cook, but that first pancake is always like the worst one, right? Because you just started. I don't know why. I don't know why that happens, but that's how it is. So you free write because then it forces your brain to focus. Now, of course, your brain is going to fight against you sitting down and typing for five or ten minutes about whatever the topic is. So what you do in free writing to not stop, because once you stop, that's the that kills it. But if you keep typing, um, what I do is when I get stuck, I'll just repeat the last word that I wrote until my brain gives me something else. So for example, I imagine I'm typing, but you can write it out too. You can actually speak it into a recorder. Some people do that. Um, when they have to write something, they'll talk about the topic into a recording and then listen to it back. It's the same thing. So free writing, free speaking, free typing, whatever. So uh, I would just start writing. My favorite food is, is, is uh, pizza. And I'm just writing whatever is coming to first in my mind with anything. All right, so you get the idea, right? I'm just writing. And you notice I repeated words because. I didn't know what to write next, and I didn't want to start. And then I have a thing like no, I even put no in there because I want I wanted to change my mind. And so, what this does is it focuses your mind, all right. And you don't necessarily have to do this, right? I've done rap lyrics before, right? First thing first, I pop up freaks, all the honeys, dummies, Playboy bunnies, those wanting money, just to tell my brain I'm about to be writing. I've written down like all the profanity I know, right? Or, you know, a poem, lyrics to a song, whatever, right? It's just to get your brain um, started on writing, to tell your brain that you're gonna be writing, all right? That's free writing. The next one is drawing. If you are artistically inclined, then use your art to write, quote unquote, right? If you like drawing, or maybe you can draw. Maybe you're like me, you don't know how to draw, but when you're on the phone, you're like got a pen and you're doodling on the phone. Or when you get bored, I always do this little ugly flower that I make, right? That's artistically inclined people. If you doodle a lot, write your name, people that write their name, I might write some graffiti. Or whatever, if you do that kind of stuff, then maybe drawing out what you want to write, right? So what that means is I'm a horrible artist, so don't judge my art, right? I might draw a pizza, I don't know, a pizza just got pepperoni on it, right? Um, and then a burger or something like a burger, right? Maybe like KFC. I can't draw, so don't be whatever. A bucket. Right? So I would just draw it out so that when it came time to write, I would take what I drew and just write out sentences about those things or whatever. Right? And then, use your native language. English is not your first language. Why are you writing in Spanish? Si inglés no está tu idioma primera, entonces, ¿por qué? 
um, are you writing in English? Right? Si estaba en México, en una escuela. Yo sé millones de palabras en inglés. Mi profesor quiere uh, or, uh, uh, escribiendo en español, pero yo sé solo diez mil pala palabras en español. Entonces, escribiré en inglés, entonces pregunto a mi amigo, ayúdame a translate into español. So, usan tu idioma primera. Entonces, I'm not to say translate, translate into English. All right. Saben más palabras en español es mejor. All right? It's better. So, write in Spanish, translate into English. All right? It's mejor. All right? And then, this one you do have to write. So this is for people like me. We call it clustering. All right? And that's where you have your topic, favorite food, and then you cluster ideas together. You can have pizza over here. Uh, pizza is easy to make. You can buy frozen pizza. Um, it has everything on it. All right, and over here I might put um, uh, some spicy and uh, yeah. So that's clustering, right? I have my topic in the middle, and then I cluster ideas so that when I go to write, I can say, uh, I have three different favorite foods. My first favorite is pizza. Pizza already has everything on it, and it's easy to make. And you can, you can buy it frozen at the store and, right? And, uh, you don't have to add anything to it. Cheeseburgers are very fast. You could get a cheeseburger out the drive-thru and they're generally inexpensive or whatever, right? My third favorite food is tacos. They're very filling because they have meat and tortillas and uh, spicy because you can add, you know, salsa and, or whatever, right? So you see, I'm just clustering the stuff. And of course, you gotta write this down. I guess you could do it on a computer too, um, if you like. And then, the last one is questioning. Right, and that's just what it sounds like. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then you just answer those questions. I don't know how to answer who for favorite food, but maybe my favorite food is my mom's cooking. And what, what does she cook? Um, Uh, usually on the weekends, 
moms make lasagna because we're at home. Why? Because um, it's filling and feeds everybody. Now, of course, you'd be typing it up. And then how, I might talk about the recipe, how it's made, right? Cheese, meat, lasagna, sauce, right? So that way, when I go to write my essay about my favorite food, it's my favorite food teacher is my mother's cooking. Every weekend, she makes lasagna at our home, right? She makes this because it's filling and it feeds everybody. We have a big family, so everybody can eat and be full. She uses a recipe that she's been making for years that her grandmother taught her that uses cheese, meat, lasagna, and sauce. So you see how you can set yourself up to write the rest. All right. So we're going to write tomorrow. One of the things that we're going to do is write an essay together. Y'all going to do it as groups. We're going to write an essay about this idea of nature versus nurture. And what that means, it's this argument that's going on amongst educated people, teachers and researchers and the like, and they want to know what, what people are trying to find out is if people are born how they're going to be, or if people are made how they're going to be. Now the answer, of course, is both. You're bo I'm born, I like to write, I became an English teacher, right? Nature and nurture, right? Because I, somebody had to teach me how to write to become an English teacher or to be able to write well. I needed to have people that taught me that. Now I may have some innate gifts or abilities that come from like naturally from my parents, right? My mom might be a good writer, so I'm born, and then I can write, and then people teach me how to write better. Our same thing with singing, right? Who's an artist y'all listen to? A rapper or a singer or whatever? Who's somebody famous right now? Little baby, right? This little baby born a good rapper, or with his, was he made a good rapper? Now, of course, we don't know, right? But we think he got skills. His skills might seem natural to people that are fans of his. So this is the argument. And tomorrow we're going to go in like depth about what that means, nature versus nurture. Because one of the things when you do your oral presentation at the end of class, one of the things that you're going to talk about are maybe some of the natural gifts that you have or things that you've learned. You're definitely going to talk about stuff that was nurtured, stuff, things that you've learned in school. But you may come with some natural gifts or talents. So what do we think? Do we think people are naturally gifted? I don't know. I don't know who y'all know, so I'll just name some super popular people in there, right? We'll figure out this. Like Michael Jackson. Was Michael Jackson naturally gifted, or did was he nurtured to be that great person? Or I don't know, Mariah Carey or Beyonce, right? Is it nature that made them who they are, these superstars? Or is it like somebody nurtured them to do it? You have to decide which one that is. So I want you to right now take about five minutes. I, I can go back over some of the pre-writing strategies if you want me to, but do like a pre-writing strategy of what you think. What do you think about nature versus nurture? Do you think people are naturally who they're gonna be or are people made who they're gonna be? And don't turn it, you don't have to turn it in yet. We're just practicing. So take about five minutes so I can fix the I need to fix the class in Canvas.